It had never been done before, and people forget what that's like. This was going to be uh, unbounded in terms of the applications. It had the potential for really revolutionizing the computing industry. People very often ask, uh, did you visualize all this? Did you plan it? No. <laughs> no one had any idea how pervasive it would be. Let us build a network and let that be the future of scientific computing. The start of all of this is that if you work on your computer and I work on my computer and you and I have to solve a problem together, wouldn't it be nice if my computer was connected to your computer? There was this organization in the government called ARPA uh, that was interested in computer networking. The Advanced Research Projects Agency is directed to moving technology in areas that are important to national security. In those days, our purpose in the Pentagon, all of it, uh, not these contractors, but all the staff, there was a man hired, a little man, a lick lighter, and it was his dream to tie the world together with, with computers. His idea was very different. The, the machines, as you said, were, used to be very big. You never touched one, and it, you talked to the programmer. Lick Lyle's idea was radically different. He wanted close interaction between the individual researcher and the computer. Lick Leiter had managed to convince a lot of people that this was a good idea, and Charlie was persuaded that uh, building a network uh, for the research community was actually a good thing for a variety of reasons. Um, sharing computer resources was a motivation, but DARPA also understood that if this was successful, it would probably make uh, a difference uh, to the Defense Department and its operation in the future. It was plausible, it was interesting. In my view, it was almost certainly doable. And so it came. The ARPA office had moved from the Pentagon, where it had been in the um, late 60s, to, the, uh, to 1400 Wilson Boulevard. There's a loss for the Pentagon to not have the technical people within easy walking distance. ARPA in those days made the computer science community and funded it and made it function. The summer of 1968, uh, DARPA actually put out a request for quotations, RFQ, asking for proposals to build a four-node packet switch net. So a lot of the ideas that I've been working on were embedded in that RFQ. There's an invention that Khan triggered and he and Vint Cerf made it together, and that's the internet protocols, without which nothing would work, and with it, just about everything works. It was, I think, the single largest engineering invention of the 20th century. Internet protocols, which I developed uh, along with my colleague Vint Cerf, were really what enabled this whole collection of worldwide components to work together seamlessly. The ARPANET was developed by a virtual organization. It was, it was six or eight different universities spread around the country. And graduate students, who are the real heroes of the, of the ARPANET. At the beginning of 1969, they started to build this uh, network. And the first node was going to be at UCLA in September 1969. Graduate students and the other staff members got together, called together in one meeting, and then we uh, initiated a series of meetings ourselves to um, sketch out what to do with this network. That led to the creation of a set of documents which uh, we uh, called uh, Request for Comments uh, as a deliberate ploy to uh, make it clear that the door was open, but they were in fact the way in which we documented the designs and the standards that we had come up with. Steve Crocker was one of a small team who installed the first imp, that is, got it running. I was in the group that was getting favored with this uh, present, if you will. It was a sort of uh, uh, a gift from on high that uh, couldn't be refused. You're going to be connected. The first connection over the ARPANET happened after I was gone. Steve Lukasik called me and said, we connected. It, it failed, it, it disconnected right away, but I said, well, that's what it's like to be first on the block. This is really working. Now, not that this is this is good if it worked. <laughs> this is really working. The youngest guy in our group, Charlie Klein, was uh, given the task of sitting down and typing the, the characters. And he, typed, uh, he tried to type login, L-O-G-I-N, as the initiation. And after 
two or three characters, the connection died and all the software broke and we had to go back to the uh, drawing boards for a short while. That was the, the Watson moment of something historic. It was absolutely clear that it was going to work. The basic idea of computers interacting with computers really was a result of the original ARPANET where it showed that that was possible. This network really was terrific for joint problem solving. <laughs> so the whole thing began to spread sort of by example. The limit that's there is not in the science, in the technology, in the hardware, in the software. The limit is up here. It's by no means at its end. It's by no means at a plateau. I think it has a long way to go, a very long way to go. An area that I think is going to be extremely important for the future uh, is that of understanding how best to use the internet to manage information. When I was a kid, I wanted two miracle things. I wanted a library that had every book in it, and I wanted a magic carpet that would take me anywhere. And I'm pretty close. I, mean, I, think it's, I think it's an amazing thing, and I've been so close to it, and I'm still amazed by it.